I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. I grew up in that era. Um, <clears throat> in case somebody thinks that um, it's unfair because usually I decorate for our superhero studies. Well, I, I did. You just can't see the invisible jet. <laughs> and, and unless you're pure of heart, you don't get to see the island of Themyscira. So if you don't see an island, then maybe we have some work to do. Um, and by the way, there are no costumes. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the legs for the Wonder Woman costume. If somebody else would like to volunteer, um, just let me know. But um, yeah, y'all can say thank you later for that, okay? Um, so we are going to start something new, and this particular series is going to start today, and it's going to go all the way through the month of May, um, as we are going to do this series called Wonder Woman of the Bible. And as I began to look out across the internet and been going out and looking at other series that were done on women in the Bible, everybody likes the biggies. Everybody likes Sarah. They like Naomi. They like Ruth. Maybe you throw in a little Jezebel or a little Delilah if you want a villain theme. You know, maybe you go with Hannah if you want to go with a big prayer theme. Um, you could always go with Mary. She's a great topic. But that's usually a Christmas thing. Um, we're not going to find any of those as our focus here, though. I decided that when I was going to do this kind of a series, I am going to go off the beaten path a little bit. We're going to probably pick some women that we don't usually talk about, at least not by themselves. Usually we end up talking about the women we're going to look at in the context of the man the story is told with. Um, as a matter of fact, usually the female is nothing more than the backstory and the man's story. And we kind of overlook that each of these women have their own precious story. Now, if you're going to do a sermon series, it's just kind of like a school lesson plan. When you start out building a sermon series, you want to decide, what am I going to accomplish with this? What is it we are trying to do? And, well, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to celebrate motherhood. And that kind of makes sense because when we get to May, we're going to all start thinking about May 12th, which is Mother's Day. By the way, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, guys, don't forget, May 12th is Mother's Day. Okay? So we're going to, we're going to celebrate the idea of motherhood as each of the women we're going to talk about is a different type of mother and you kind of think of different type what kind of types are you when they see now you got to come back and figure out what types of mothers are there so it's a different type of mother we're going to celebrate motherhood we're going to explore how much god cares for women um i think a lot of times we, we downplay this but but women have a special place with god um we're going to look at how god incorporates them into his plan for humanity and again sometimes we write that part off we think that well no, it was all about Adam and it was all about this. Was, understand, women had a big role in how we got to the cross and how we got to the sacrifice. As a matter of fact, just so you know, man kind of got cut off because all the way back at the beginning, God told Eve it would be from her seed that the Messiah would come. It was a virgin birth, remember? Guys didn't really get to play that much of a role in it right there at the last moment. It was all about the women. Um, and then as we begin to look at how much God cares for them and how much he incorporates them into his plan, then you know, we're going to get in a greater understanding for the women God places in our lives, in our homes, and ultimately in our church. Um, a lot of times we downplay just how important women are in our lives. And then at Mother's Day, we pull out the one sermon and we dust it off and we try to give a little bit of a shout out to women. We're, we're going to take a month and a week and we're going to take a look at just how important women are and if you're going to do a woman's study or a female study then you kind of got to start with an origin story and if you're going to start with the origin story of women then guess where you have to go all the way back to the beginning we have to go talk about the mother of all mothers she was the very first mom, the very first woman. If you want to follow along in your Bible as far as the story goes, you can go to Genesis chapter 2. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, you can pull the one right out of the pew rack. And guess what? You can turn to page 2. Because we're going to be all the way back at the very beginning of the Bible, all the way back at the beginning of the story. And we are going to talk about this woman named Eve. And, well, her story is usually told, as I said, in conjunction with Adam. Um, she's kind of... The afterthought is what we want to say. Um, as a matter of fact, she usually gets a bad rap because she's the dame that fed her husband the fruit. That's how we want to portray Eve. Um, she's the person that didn't have enough sense not to listen to a snake. Um, Eve is the punchline of the creation story a lot of times. And you know what? Nothing could be further from the truth. 
See, because I want to remind you of a very few important things about her backstory and where she comes from. As far as Eve goes, you do understand, according to God, his creation was not good without her. Think about that. It's not good without woman. It did not work without women. Um, she was so magnificent that Adam loved her at first sight. Now, that's impressive. I mean... You know, usually you have to get to know a person, but I guess if she's the only person around, you would thought, yeah, well, okay, he, he loved her because he had no choice, right? Well, you do understand Adam did have some choices in his relationship with Eve because that love for her was so deep that Adam knowingly and willingly sacrificed his perfect relationship with God to preserve his relationship with his wife. That has got to be a wonder woman. Somebody that was so important to him that when he had the choice, choose God or choose her, you, you get it, right? He chose her. He made her relationship the priority. And that caused some problems, and we're going to talk about the problems, but I just want you to understand this is not one of those sermons where we're going to just basically bash Eve for whatever happened in the garden, because that's not the story of Eve. That's actually the story of Adam. I want to take a look at her story. And her story begins with she has a unique purpose. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed all out of the ground, all of, all of the wild animals and all of the birds of the sky. He brought them to man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and the wild animals, but... For Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, I want you to make sure I under you understand this. Eve was not an afterthought. It's not like God did all the creation and all the things and did all the work and put it all together. He said, you know what? I, I got a little extra time on my hands, so I think I'll just make one more thing. It, it wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't after he was done, he came back and said, whoops, I forgot something. I guess I better put this in. Um, as it says, again, creation was incomplete until God made Eve. It wasn't finished. It wasn't done. And the next thing I want you to know is I want you to see is God understood woman's value before man. Now, this probably is not a surprise to most females. But God realized how valuable females would be before man ever figured it out. It was God who identified the problem. It is not good for man to be alone. He helped man understand the need, and how did he help any guy understand the need? Well, he gave him a job. He said, hey, Adam, I want you to look out here and look at all the animals that maybe you aren't paying all that attention to, and I want you to give all of them a name. And he began the task, and when he ends, he begins to notice that there's none quite like me, God. What's going on here? Now, the story doesn't explicitly say it, but I got a feel that this must have bothered Adam when he looked around and saw everything had its place, but he was by himself. It also doesn't say it, but I got a feeling Adam expressed his displeasure to God. Say, hey, God, what's up with this? I mean, you made everybody else to have a mate or a helper or a sidekick or somebody else. And God, I'm, I'm standing here. I'm all by myself. And of course, at that point, I got a feeling we have the very first prayer request. God, fix my need. God, take care of this. And so as he did that, God said, I tell you what I'm going to do, Adam. I'm going to make you a helper suitable. And yes, I put that word in quotes because that's a word that gets us in a great deal of trouble. And I think that word, the way we translate that word, doesn't really fit with what God had intended. Because a helper is a person who helps someone else. Um, if you're thinking in the superhero world, this would be the sidekick. This would be the Robin to the Batman. You know, this would be the person that is as of a lesser role. He isn't the main character. Yeah, they've got some powers and they've got some special places, but, but they aren't the actual hero. They are just a sidekick. And so when I get the idea of helper, we kind of think that God said, yeah, well, we'll make somebody to take care of man. No, that wasn't it. See, we've got the wrong word. The word really shouldn't be helper. The word should be companion is what God was after. Now, what is a companion? Well, when you go look that word up in the dictionary, there are a lot of things a companion is. A companion is a person with whom one spends a lot of time or with one who, one who travels. So it's kind of a person that goes through life with you. 
A companion is also a person who shares exper the experiences of another, especially when these are unpleasant or unwelcome. So the idea of a companion is the idea is somebody that, that goes through the good and the bad with you. Somebody that sticks with you. That's why when the, in the marriage ceremony we have the idea of for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer. It isn't just for the good times, it's for the bad time. A companion um, is a person's long-term sexual partner. That's a definition the dictionary gives, and that was a purpose that God had put out here for man and female, for male and female. And then, of course, the one that I like the best, that as far as when you look up the word companion, it is one of a pair of things that were intended to complement or match each other. It's two sides of a coin. They were designed to go together to feed one off of the other. There isn't one part that's more important than the other. They are both equally as important because together they make up the whole. Now, probably you're wondering, well, how do you know that's what God intended, not just the idea of a helper? Well, because I know and God intended it to be a companion because look at how God helped him see the need. It wasn't like Adam was just sitting around and said, you know, something's wrong with this guy. God had to help him see it. God had to see there's something missing from your life, Adam. You just don't even realize it's not there yet, so let me help you out. So looking around as Adam finished again, he looked around and he saw nothing, nothing that he wanted to be intimate with, nothing that he wanted to share his life with, nothing that would fit, fit the need, would fit the bill of a companion. There were lots of animals there that could have helped him, he had horses to help plow the ground. He had cows to help do this. He had all these animals around, but, but nothing that he would consider anything to be intimate with. And then he saw nothing that was, nothing that was capable of sharing his life with. Sorry, dogs, man's best friend, didn't fit it for Adam. The dog was there. He's like, well, it's a nice dog, but you know what? That is not how I want to share my life. I got a bigger need, God. You see... Um, Adam didn't need any help living his life. See, here's the reality. Um, for those who think that female was created to take care of man, um, when Eve was created, there were no clothes to wash. They were naked. There, there, was, no, there were no chores. I mean, I mean, there were no clothes at all. So, so it's not like Eve was, taken, was created to take care of the laundry. Um, God had made his food ready to eat. I mean, it was all growing right there on the trees. You just had to walk by. and They didn't even have pesticides back then. You just pull it right off the, off the tree and begin to eat. You, you, you get it that, that God had made his food ready to eat. So Eve was not created to be a cook. That wasn't her purpose. That wasn't what she was designed to do. Um, there were no kids, obviously. Um, but, but you do understand that female was not created to take care of the needs of the kids. They were created to be a companion to man. The kids were the secondary relationship behind the relationship between man and woman. So this idea that, well, you know what, the females are to take care of the kids and the, and the guys go off, and that, that wasn't the picture. They were supposed to be co-parents working together as a whole, two sides of the same coin, because they were companions. They were two pieces, but they were one individual is what we're going to see. And um, it's not like Adam needing any help taking care of the garden. Really. He didn't. I mean, there were no weeds, there were no thorns, there were no thistles. Everything was going to grow, but, but all Adam, only thing Adam had to do was take care of this garden, and it's not like it was going to be that time-consuming. So Adam didn't need a helper like we usually want to define woman's role. He wasn't looking for somebody to take care of himself as far as be his mom. Adam was looking for something much deeper. Adam needed a relationship. See, when he looked at all the other animals out there, he looked at all the other creatures out there, he began to watch how they moved together and how they worked together and how they cooperated together and how they related together. And Adam's like, you know what? God, you didn't make that for me. I, I, I need that relationship. And I am incomplete unless I have that relationship. Now, here's the funny thing. Did Adam have a relationship? Yeah. God. But you do realize, and we don't really think about this, even in man's perfect state, no sin, God wasn't enough. Wrap your brain around that for a second. We think that it's sin that caused God not to be enough. 
God wasn't enough and God intended for it to be that way. He wanted Adam to see, you know what? You need a relationship, something to go back and forth. You need a compliment to yourself. And while man was created in the image of God, you do get the idea that this idea of woman was to make man's creation complete. And without her, it just doesn't work the way it's supposed to. Things begin to unwind and go south very, very, very quickly. You see, Eve had a very unique origin. Now, this is how she was made. Now, I want you to pay real close attention. We're going to come back and dive into this. Verses 21 through 22. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib and had taken out of the man and brought her to the man. Now, when I say she has a unique way of being created, let's go back into the story and let's look at verse 19. How were all the other creatures created? Well, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He used dirt. When he got to man, male, this verse 7, guess what? Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So we do have a, a difference in how he breathed into his nostrils, but you do get to understand where he started with the basic materials. Where did, where did man come from? Dirt. Same as the rest of the animals. God started with dirt for both man and all the other animals. But then when he came along and he said, you know what, it's not good for man to be alone. We're going to have to um, make him a woman, make somebody a companion. He got to Eve, and well, her story is a little different how he went about creating her. First thing he did is he, he, he put the man to sleep. And I know he's probably typical. You know, there's work to be done. Man's going to go to sleep. Okay, he's going to do surgery. Give the guy a break. We're talking major surgery here. This is anesthesia is what he's doing. Okay, so, so he puts the man to sleep. He gives the man some anesthesia. Adam goes to sleep. And then God performs the surgery. Um, God does the little work. And it says he took the man's rib and then closed up the place with the flesh. Well, I want to make sure we get the word right. Because, we, again, this is one of those things when we were translating, we've got a word that doesn't make sense when we say the word rib. Because the word rib, as far as Hebrew goes, that word is chaldi. You find that word, that word in Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, when it's talking about a rib from somebody's mouth, when, it, when he's eating a rib. So like when we think about a rib, like a baby back rib, with the ribs and the, and the skeletal side, that, that, that word for the Hebrews would be chaldi. Um, the word that's used in Genesis here is actually salat. And we find that word in Scripture also. Matter of fact, we find that word a lot. We find it in Exodus chapter 25, Exodus chapter 37, 1 Kings chapter 6, Job chapter 18, 2 Samuel chapter 16. And you know what that word is usually translated as? Side. So, so you get what God did, right? He took a big chunk of of man's side. He took not just a bone, it says he took a side. He took basically a blob of man. And he said, I'm going to create woman. I love the way, that, the idea that Matthew, Matthew Henry puts out. The woman was not made out of his head to rule over him, nor out of his feet to be trampled upon him, but out of his side to be equal with him under his arm to be protected by him and near his heart to be loved by him. See, this idea that God was trying to make Adam understand is I'm going to make you something very, very special. Now, I guess technically Eve was made from dirt because she was made from man and man was made from dirt. So I guess you could go around about way, but I want you to make sure you understand the symbolism here goes well beyond just the location of the chunk of flesh that God took out. Um, to truly understand the relationship that God was going to set up between man and woman, Adam had to, and here's our word, Adam had to sacrifice. Adam had to be willing to give of himself. And what God couldn't go back to the dirt and make Eve and then bring, him there, bring her there and say, here she is, Adam. No, Adam, for you to understand the concept of this relationship, it's going to have to come from you. 
It's going to not be a subset of you, just so you know. Um, Eve was not just a portion of man. She was the complete complement of man. She was the side of man that was missing before she got there. She brought something new and unique to the relationship that Adam did not have before. And it was his equal, but it was different. And that's important for us to remember because from, from, he formed the woman from the side of the man. Man, that, that must have been kind of when Adam woke up. And it says he closed up the flesh. I guess God's good at cosmetic surgery. I, I don't even know if Adam realized what God had done at that point. But when he finally came out from the anesthesiologist, the anesthesiologist and he was all awake, um, God said, hey, Adam, look what I made. And he came and he presented Eve, woman, to man. And man of man, Adam's like, good job, God. Thumbs up. I, th- I, I, I think you've met the need, the, the idea of relationship. I think we've got this covered because when Adam sees her, these are his words. Didn't give God a schematic, hey God, you missed this or missed that. Can you fix this? Can we change that? Uh, is it dry? Can we? No, this is what he said. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. That was Adam's response when he saw Eve. He was like, wow. And he realized from the moment he saw her, they were destined to have a unique physical relationship. How does Adam identify her? Bone of my bone. Flesh of my flesh. She's not an extension of me, but yet she is also a part of me. We are connected physically because God didn't go back to the dirt to make you, Eve. God took you from me because he wanted me to learn a lesson. See, the lesson wasn't for Eve. The lesson was for Adam. He wanted Adam to understand, she is precious to you. Take good care of her. Because she is the ultimate completion of creation. You do realize, when Eve got there, God was done creating. That was it. I guess you could say he saved the best for last because he was done. He didn't create anything else at that point because this unique physical relationship was there. Woman was taken out of man and Adam realized it. And you know what? The Apostle Paul realized this too. When he was writing to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 4 through 5, this is how Paul explained this physical relationship. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. You say, what? Wait a minute. There's more. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to the wife. Do not deprive each other, except perhaps in mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer, then come together again, so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. You get what God has set up here. When you become one flesh, when you become man and wife, then your body belongs to, the woman's body belongs to the man, and the man's body belongs to the woman, because it goes back and forth, and God is saying, I've taken the two parts, and I put them back together. Just like I intended it. That's the picture. And what an awesome picture is, if we just got this picture straight, think how much better our society would be. If we just got to the point we understood this, that you know what? It's a unique physical relationship between man and woman. They had nothing between them. They were totally naked because they were designed to fit together. There was a unique emotional relationship between these two. Um, the relationship between man and woman become the most important relationship. Just so you know, when I was doing my premarital counseling, not when I was premarital counseling somebody else, when I actually did my premarital counseling, I still remember the main thing the minister told us is, hey, look, guys, there are only three fights in a marriage. I'm like, really? Yeah, you're either fighting about sex, money, or in-laws. Interesting, 
Two of those items are covered right here in Adam. He already covered the physical thing, and now he's going to cover the in-law thing. And what did Adam say? This is why a man leaves his father and mother. This relationship between a man and a woman is the most important relationship there is. It can't be secondary to anything, including the kids. You do understand the marriage relationship is more important than the kid relationship. In fact, if you don't have the marriage relationship straight, then all the kids are going to do is strain the relationship that's already unraveling right before you. Kids don't fix a marriage relationship. They, re they reveal every single flaw that's in it. Um, that's what they did. You do understand that God wanted to help everybody, help everybody understand it's the marriage relationship, this unique emotional relationship. You're designed to go back together. Usually you don't end up marrying somebody just like you because you drive each other crazy. What do you usually end up marrying? Somebody that's a little bit opposite from you. Usually they have a skill set or a personality that's not you. Because you know what you're trying to do, don't you? You're trying to complete yourself. You realize there's something missing. And so I have to put the pieces back together. And so that is what Adam saw when he saw Eve. He said, wow, now I'm complete. Now I've got everything I need. Now both parts are back together. Thank you, God. Of course, not only do they have a unique emotional and a unique physical um, they also had a um, unique spiritual relationship now that's important because you do understand that they were now different but yet they were the same the relationship of Adam and Eve um, the two opposites became together now unfortunately their spiritual relationship um, actually became they became more important to each other than even God um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 says, When the woman saw the fruit of the tree, and it was good for food and pleasing to their eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and, and ate it. Now, this is the part we like to pound Eve. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. You understand, Eve was deceived. Adam comes onto the scene. Adam's not deceived. Adam looks out at his wife, and she also gave some to her husband, so she gives the fruit to him. And Adam now has a choice. Big choice huge choice. Do I eat it and stay with my wife? Or do I take it to God and make that relationship the priority? Now, we know how he chose, right? He heard God's voice ringing in the back of his head, it's not good for man to be alone, and I refuse to be alone. He chose that relationship. But that unique spiritual relationship between man and woman was just going to be there, and God understood it. God wasn't jealous of the relationship between man and woman. He gave the relationship between man and woman. That's the relationship that he wanted us to have. Now you say, well, why would God do that? Wouldn't this have been much simpler if he just left Adam like an like a earthworm and he could reproduce without woman? I mean, wouldn't that have worked a whole lot better if, if we didn't have two sides, if we didn't have that competition? You, you do get what God is doing, right? See, their relationship was supposed to be an object lesson. This, this idea of Eve and the idea that she came along, God is trying to teach something, not just to Adam, um, it echoes across time. In Ephesians chapter 5, verses 25 through 28, it says, Husbands, love your wives. It's interesting. Do you know that there is nowhere in the Bible where it says, Wives, love your husbands? That instruction is never given to a female anywhere in the Bible. Wives, love your husbands. You know why? Because it's in their nature. Okay, that's what makes women unique. But in this one it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy and cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You see the object lesson here? This relationship between how man and woman were supposed to work was the exact same relationship how God and humanity was supposed to work. God wanted to be the complement to the relationship between man and woman. It's a love triangle. God at the top and the two sides of humanity. All together it works really well. Split apart not so much. It all begins to fall apart. 
You see, God wanted to give us a unique opportunity. God so loved us, God so much desired a relationship that he created humanity. And then he split humanity into two sides so that we would be dependent on one another so that we could learn how to coexist in a relationship. And then God said, by the way, folks, this is the way I want to coexist with you. That's the kind of relationship I want with you. I want that relationship where there is nothing between us, where we are naked before God. And we can commune with God openly and honestly. And you get, that's why Eve was put into the picture. She wasn't here to do chores. She wasn't here to be a baby-making machine. She wasn't here because Adam couldn't figure out how to balance a checkbook. Eve was placed on this planet so that she could teach humanity what it means to love. So that she could teach humanity what it means to live in a relationship. So that then that relationship could be transposed with God. And we would have the whole relationship. The three sides of the triangle would be put back together. I don't know if you ever thought of Eve that way. But you do understand Adam loved her that much. He gave himself for her. Now, he could have gone a different route, different sermon for a different day. Um, there was another action Adam could have took, but he did see the value in Eve. And you do understand that God sees the value in us. So much so that God was willing to do the almost the exact same thing that Eve did. I mean, that Adam did. He was willing to sacrifice himself in order to maintain the relationship with me and you. Isn't that awesome? God played the role and said, hey, guess what? I am willing to sacrifice myself. And now the only question is, is what are we going to do with that sacrifice? God laid out the relationship for us to see here so that we could experience it with him. But you do realize that requires, just like Adam and Eve, the two had to become one. We have to be willing to, sac- to accept that sacrifice that God gave, and we must become one. And we do that by following Christ. 